Um, sit anywhere you want, but wave to your advisor. Okay, go down those rows, go down those rows. <laughs> okay, everybody take a seat. Everybody take a seat. We'll go ahead and get started. Okay, pick your row, pick a row, pick any row, pick any row. Which row will you be in? Okay, everybody get seated. You don't have to sit with your advisor group, but I want you to wave to them. You need to make contact with your advisor. If there's a seat next to them, please sit next to them. Yeah, 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 otherwise too hard, I get it. Okay, everybody in the middle here, can you have a seat? Everybody in the middle here, go ahead and pick a side. Go sit with your advisor. If you are not with your advisor, can you find them with your eyes right now? Find them. Okay, everybody have a seat. Okay, everybody have a seat. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Come on in, if you're in the back, come on in. We've got lots of seats in the back, come on in, come on in. Come on in. Welcome, welcome. Okay, go ahead and find a seat. Can I have your attention please? Thank you for being here today. Thank you for coming to this event. I hope that you guys have had fun with the book, Karun and the Sea of Stories. All right, yes, yes. Um, before I say any more, I'm going to hand it over to Ms. V, and she's going to introduce our opening act. Good afternoon. Uh, can you all hear me? So we've got two of our um, groups from grade eight who will be performing a couple of the scenes that they themselves have chosen uh, as part of their formal formative for drama. Uh, they're very nervous, be kind, okay? Uh, these are two very good. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, they've worked incredibly hard today <laughs> and on Friday, uh, and they deserve to show what their interpretation of what these scenes uh, have come across to them. So please enjoy. Look around the valley of K in the town of C. This trip, it's gonna be perfect for us. I mean, with your mom being gone, it's been really difficult. But I feel like this, this is what we need. Haroon, Haroon. He doesn't get it how it works. Since my mom left us, it has been really hard. Until he understands. Until he understands that his stories are useless and pointless, I'm not gonna talk with him. And I've been working on this story for so long and I just feel like this, this is the right moment. Right, right, Haroon? Haroon? Talk, talk, yeah, yeah. I, I just can't wait. I mean, what is the point of your stories?
Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, today I introduce to you the one and the only Rashid Khalifa, a.k.a. the Shah of the Blah. You know what? I'm going to let him do the talking. Hello, everyone. I'm so privileged to be standing here right now and sharing one of the stories that I've been working on my entire life. It's called... Uh, uh, I don't know what's happening. I've been working on this story my entire life, and the one moment where I actually need to say it, I can't. I don't know what's wrong. This is the most important day of my life, and with Haroon and my wife leaving, I just, I just can't do it, and I can't even bring him up on my own, and this, this isn't what I needed. Maybe Haroon was right. What's the point of my stories anyway? We're going to be performing a scene from the book Haroon. The scene that we're going to be performing is when Rashid enters the Lana Kahani and is telling the guppies about what happened at the Twilight Strip. Arjuna is going to be playing. Rashid. Lucy's going to be playing. Prince Bolo. Anjali is going to be playing. Haroon. What is Bezaban? You may all know, but I have no idea. Bezaban is, is a ginormous statue of ice. Some would even say Colossus. Its tongue is ripped off and is placed in the citadel of Chup with, with teeth the size of houses at the home of Katamshad. I wish I didn't ask. While I was there at the Twilight Strip, I also saw the Chup soldiers easily accessing into our land. That's how they kidnapped the princess, but she, or what I believe to be. What's that you say? Proceed, for pity's sake, proceed. While I was there, when how I know that it was her, I heard her, the ugliest voice I have ever seen. And her hair, her nose. Mm -hmm. You need to go on. That was Bachit, all right. Oh, Bachit, Bachit. When will I ever, ever hear your sweet, sweet voice? and gaze upon your face again. Well done to grade eight. <laughs> Thank you for watching them. <laughs> grade eight let's hear it for grade eight okay so uh, that was just our opening act maybe to remind you a little bit of what went on in Haroon and the sea of stories uh, so we would like now to welcome as part of one book Woodstock Miss Paro Anand she is an award-winning author and here to tell you a little bit more about Miss Paro is our CFI intern Navia Jane Um, hey guys, so uh, Ms. Paro Anand is a Sahitya Academy Bal Sahitya Award winner for her book Wild Child, now published as Like Smoke. She's written books for children, young adults and adults. She's well known for her work with children in difficult circumstances, including those impacted by violence in Kashmir, through her writing as well as her program Literature in Action. She holds a world record for helping over 3,000 children make the world's longest newspaper. Ms. Anand was invited to speak at the Harvard India Conference USA on disruptive innovation in literature for young adults and children and has been awarded for her contribution to children's literature by the Russian Center for Science and Culture. No Guns at My Son's Funeral, which opened to rave reviews, 
was on the International Board on Books for Young People Honor List and has been translated into German and French. She has headed the National Center for Children's Literature. The Little Bird Who Held Up the Sky With His Feet was on the 1001 Books to Read Before You Grow Up, an international gold standard of the world's best books. Her book, Wingless, a fairly weird fairy tale, has been performed nationally and internationally. She has co-authored two, a graphic novel with Swedish writer Orjan Persson. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Navia. And without any further ado, we welcome Ms. Paro Anand. Well, I think you can hear me without a mic, right? Oh, it did come on. Okay. All right. So, hi, my name is Paro Anand, and I've been writing for what feels a hundred years, uh, mostly for young people like you. This is my fourth trip to Woodstock, and I have been uh, the one and only. Uh, writer in residence, and the book that came out of that was this one called Pure Sequence, uh, which it was incredible to be here because I I was um, I had nothing else to do. There was somebody cooking, cleaning, laying my bed. Um, I had no internet, which was actually a great boon. I had no mobile connectivity. I was living in a little cottage in Oakville. And so I managed to write for 17, 18 hours a day and literally wrote the first draft of this book in three weeks. <laughs> so that was quite an achievement for me because this book, uh, no Guns at My Son's Funeral took me five years to write. So <laughs> those are two very different um, experiences of writing. And why you see the books on the chairs and me below the stage while they sit grandly on stage is because the books have brought me here. If it wasn't for the books, Paro Anand would not be invited to, to be talking to you today. And so they're the true guests, they're the chief guests, they're the, the actual creative uh, power. And that's how I feel about books and stories. They are the creators, they are the, they have the power, you know. Uh, this book, No Guns at My Son's Funeral, opened in a very strange way, you know, when I wrote it. I wrote it in response to my work in Kashmir, where I was working with orphans of terrorist violence. Uh, and there were 50 kids who had all lost their parents to terrorism. Uh, and there were Muslim children and Hindu children there were displaced people and those who were just stuck there. And the Kargil conflict, which was a warlike situation with Pakistan, broke out right then. And that is what really inspired No Guns at My Son's Funeral. But it was the first book of its kind in the country. There, was, there had never been a book of such extreme darkness for young people written in India. And so I showed it around to some school heads uh, because I wanted this to be a book for young adults. And a couple of them said that the title was too harsh, No Guns at My Son's Funeral. And so we changed the title to Kashmir, The Other Side of Childhood. Um, but the night before it was going into print, 
I just couldn't sleep. And early morning, I called the publisher. I said, no, it must go back to no guns at my son's funeral. And now when I often put my books up, and I ask kids, which book do you want me to read from? So often they'll say, no guns at my son's funeral. And I say, why? And they say, because of the title. So what do adults know about what children want to read? <laughs> and this book, when it turned 15 years old, it became the fastest selling book for young people in India till then. And it has been continuously published for over 15 years now. But when it was published for, uh, at 15 years old, a book is considered a classic. And so we republished it with a new cover. Um, I don't know which cover you like better. But anyway, so there's a new cover. And then there's a follow-up work as well. So. Um, when Harun and the Sea of Story first came out, it was, of course, soon after the fatwa against uh, Salman Rushdie. But reading it now today, when just in preparation for coming here, I read it after many years, and I thought, gosh, it's even more true than it was then when he wrote it. Why? Does anyone know why it's more relevant today than it was then? Anybody? Yeah. It's a dystopian because? It's a dystopian literature. It's dystopian literature, right? That's, yeah, sure, that would be one reason. What else? Why, why is it so relevant to Salman Rushdie today? Long, yes, yep. He was ahead of his time. He was ahead of his time, for sure. Salman Rushdie certainly was. And he brought Indian literature center stage internationally. Yeah, there was somebody there. Yep. And the book and the attack against Salman Rushdie, they both related to translation translation. Exactly, exactly. The, the attack on Salman Rushdie. And what did the attack take? When the attack happened and the you know, afterwards, after all the doctors and everybody have struggled, what has he lost? His right hand and an eye. You take away the writing hand of a writer, you have shut him up. You take away the eye of observation of a writer and you have shut him up. And Salman Rushdie, and Rashid. Isn't it strange how those names actually mirror each other so closely? And this moment of trying to shut people up is more true today even than when uh, Rashdi wrote the book so many years ago. And that is what gave me goosebumps. And I'm so glad that this is the book that was chosen how many of you have read it? If, if we could have the house lights on, actually. We, I'd like to see everybody. Could we have the house lights on? So, how many of you have read the book? Okay, wow. Fantastic. Yes, I can put up my hand as well. <laughs> and... How many of you loved it? Wow, somebody jumping out of his chair. I'll jump out as well. Yeah. How many of you liked it? How many of you didn't like it at all? Okay, great. Very nice to have your honest opinion because that matters. We're not trying to shut you up. If you don't like something, you're welcome to say, I didn't like it. Right. And I'm sure a lot of you in the grades that you are in felt, why have we been given this sort of fairy tale like book? Why this book? We should have been given a more grown up book to read. How many of you felt that? It should have been a more grown up book. 
Anybody felt that? It was too childish? OK, a few of you. So it is, in a way, a children's book, the only one that he's written for children. But it's also a deeply political book. It's a very edgy and difficult and political book that deals with very difficult issues. And um, that's what I think makes it so powerful. The power, of, the power of silence is a great power. When you sit in silence by yourself, it's very powerful. But there's also a danger in silence. When you are silenced, the silence is not coming from within you, but from without. And you're being told, keep quiet, sit down, don't talk, do not, we don't want to know your opinion. Right? There's that danger in silence. There's another danger which is brewing. And it's so well reflected in Harun and the Sea of Story. The culture of hate, where we are being taught to hate people constantly. Who are we to being told to hate is anybody other than a person like me. Anyone who is not me, we should hate them. Where it, maybe it's not coming directly, but it's coming very insidiously into our lives. Sometimes parents are feeding us hate along with our dinner. And that's a very dangerous thing. And I'm going to read to you one of my stories. It's called The Yellow Flowers of August. And you'll see these very yellow flowers. I was so lucky that when I was going just, just uh, next to the greenhouse, there are the yellow flowers, which I've seen after a long time. I was so, it was like such a connection for me. The Yellow Flowers of August. This is from my book, Like Smoke which a group of interns helped me uh, work with as well, school interns. I hate Muslims. I always have. Well, almost always. Ever since I learned what Muslims were. And yes, there is this ripple that goes through and, said, and says, and the ripple says, surely our school didn't invite this woman who hates Muslims. Surely not. And surely not. These are not Paro Anand's words. I have a Muslim son. I do not hate Muslims. This is the character speaking. Ever since I learned what Muslims were, I hate them. These people who are as black as the clothes they wear, long black beards for the men, black shrouds for the women. Not that any of that matters to me, why should it? As long as I'm no Muslim, that's all. I don't hate them for their clothes. I hate them because they are first class killers. They are bloodthirsty, and they have nothing better to do than run around killing people. I know this for a fact, cold-blooded fact. The blood that day was red and flowing and real and hot. The only thing that was cold that day was the heart of the killers. There were so many, many people killed that day. Not that I cry for all of them. Why should I? How can I? But there is one who has my tears, had my tears, and they haven't dried up since. I cry every day for my father my beautiful, wonderful, beloved father, 
whose only fault was that he had gone to work that day, promising to earn some money to buy a chicken, and he would make it in the way only he knew how, because it was my mother's birthday. But he never came back. There was a blast in the market in front of the temple, and many people were blown to bits, including my beloved father. We never found anything of him. Nothing remained, and maybe that was better. My father, always so crisply clean, I wouldn't have wanted to see him a bloody mess. And so I hate Muslims. Since that day, I hate them. It was them that did it, so I want nothing to do with them. And so we left. We left Kashmir, moving to my nana and nani's house in the city. It wasn't easy, not for me, but it was nice to see my mother being cared for. They treated my mother like a child, and they made me grow up. I became the parent, my mother became my child. I went to a new school, the nearest one that would take me. It was an international residential school, and guess where that's inspired from? <laughs> and it started its new year in August. I joined on the first day of the session and there were a few other newcomers. So I wasn't noticed much, which was nice. I don't like to be noticed anymore. We sat in a circle to introduce ourselves. I noticed this really good looking boy sitting across from me. He looked at me too and smiled. I smiled back, sort of, and then quickly looked away. As girls back home, we used to talk about falling in love, though no one else had. And I had said I didn't believe in love at first sight. Right now, I wondered if that's what the butterflies in my stomach were. The name spun around me. The teachers were making us play a game where you had to say everyone's name as they said it. Vandana, Bijoya, Priya, Vipin, Amar. I couldn't really remember them. I wasn't paying attention. I was concentrating on the good-looking boy. That was the one name I wanted to know and remember. His turn was coming up. I leaned forward so I would catch it. Well, I caught it all right and dropped it like it was a hot coal. Khalid, he had said. Khalid, a Muslim name. I hated him immediately. I shot him a furious look. I don't know if he saw me or not. I, I hope he had. Well, the rest of the session was a blur, and for some reason we weren't having classes. Some, one of the older students told me that on the first day we just played games, broke ice, introduced ourselves, got to know each other. I kept trying to get the boy out of my head, but he kept creeping back into my field of vision. Then we were put into pairs, and we had to enact an impromptu play. And wouldn't you know it, I was lumped with Khalid, the only Muslim boy in the class. I went to the teacher to try and persuade her to, to let me change, but she was adamant, no, no changes. What are you so angry about? Came a voice behind me. I whirled around. Of course, it was Khalid. Hi, I'm Khalid, and you're Nitya, right? He held his hand out, but I was damned if I was going to shake him, to shake his hand, touch him. I heard these people are filthy. I've been told that. Hi, I snapped, putting my hands firmly behind my back. Okay, he smiled looking at his hand as though he felt sorry for it. He had a really nice smile. I mean, a really, really nice smile. 
Behave yourself, he said to his hand. Can't you see that Nitya is angry and doesn't want to be friends right now? He smacked his right hand with his left. Hand says sorry. Will you forget it? forgive it? I couldn't help the smile, but I didn't want to go all mushy now. You hit this guy, I reminded myself. So, any ideas for the, plays we, for the play we have to do? I snapped. If he was going to be all cute and funny, well, he better come up with some ideas. I certainly didn't have any. Hmm, how about a play about this really, really angry girl and a boy who has no idea what she's angry about? I think we could make it quite realistic, you and I. Very funny, I scowled. Why, thank you, he smiled back. I thought you'd like it. I didn't know how to react, but I wasn't coming up with any bright ideas myself. Khalid led me to a quiet spot behind a bush of yellow flowers with a really nice fragrance. As we sat down, Khalid started to talk. He had a lovely voice, deep like a man. And his eyes, oh, those eyes, like liquid honey. I couldn't help looking into those eyes. I couldn't be angry with eyes that beautiful. So he began speaking softly. For our play, let's say there's a beautiful princess. Her hair is frame, framing her face like a halo. She looks like the princess of angels, but there is an anger in her. Deep and dark, a fire burns. Many people came to try and cool the anger down. Dances, food, music, jokes, and stories. Handsome princes and wealthy kings came with kind words and offers of marriage. But did the princess's anger subside? Did it? No. No, I tried to snap, but a smile crept up. No, you're quite right, nothing worked. But then one day, a joker arrived. Oh, he wasn't good looking or anything. Yes, he was. What's that? Uh, I, I, I mean, he, he, let's say he was good looking. Let's pretend. Ah, a good looking joker. Hmm? Okay, could you describe this joker, please? I scrabbled around, trying to think of something as far from Khalid as possible. But I was drowning in those liquid honey eyes. And in trying to distract myself, I started pinching the skin on my wrist. It's something I had started to do since, since my father had died. There were wounds that I plucked at, pinching and pinching and digging the skin. Khalid's face grew suddenly dark. He dropped his lashes, shutting out his honey eyes. Had I done something? What was it? We just sat there quietly, me pinching and pinching and pinching my wrists. Khalid leaned forward. He held my hand and he gently started to rub his thumb over the wounds on my wrists. It felt nice. It soothed me. You're really, really angry, aren't you? He whispered, so low that I had to lean forward to make his words out. But why are you angry at me? I don't understand. Did I do something? What could I say? I couldn't tell him my anger, could I? But I couldn't stop the tears either. His fingers were so soft on my raw, raw skin. 
my father died. I sobbed. I never said this out loud, not in these unchangeable, unmistakable words. My father died. He was killed. He was killed. Who? Who did it? I looked at him. I hoped he'd understand. Muslims. There, I had said it. And now he could go back to hating me. We could go from being trying to be friends to being enemies forever. He went all quiet. He took his hand away, although I wished he would continue soothing my wounds. I was breathing hard, panicking, wishing I could take back those words, wishing none of this had happened. Finally, I couldn't bear it any longer. I leaned forward and picked his hand up and stroked the inside of his wrist. Although there were no visible wounds there, I could feel the rush of his pulse. In a very low voice, but an angry voice, he asked, was it a Muslim or was it a terrorist that killed him? How does it matter? He died. It's not one and the same thing, you know. It's not. What? Muslims and terrorists. It's not one and the same thing. I don't care. I was crying again. Well, you should. You should. You must care. And you can't paint me with the terrorist brush either. Why not? Why not? My father is dead and it was a Muslim bomb that killed him. Bombs don't have a religion. Terrorists don't have a religion. And don't put my belief in the same breath as terrorism. I started to argue, but he held up his hand. My father, he said, is in the Indian Army. I live without my father every day. He's putting his life on the line so that more nityas don't happen again. Get it? I miss my father too. He really did want me to, need me to understand, and I think maybe a little bit I did. At least I was beginning to. He didn't say anything more. His head hung low. The spicy, sweet fragrance of the flowers lit up the air. I was trying to find something to say, something to break this darkness that had fallen between us. Um, those flowers smell great, right? But Khalid just nodded. Awkward silence. What are these flowers called, you know? I was desperate. <laughs> I was supposed to be the moody one. Why was he going all broody on me? But I just got a shrug out of him. I leaned forward. I held his hands in mine. And then, without planning it, without thinking, I was on my knees and I kissed him on his cheek. We were both startled. I sat back down with a bump, my hand flying to my lips, Oh my God, if someone had just seen us, I would have been thrown out of school on my very first day. But no one was around. Everyone was engrossed in their own plays and we were protected by the yellow flowers. And I had just kissed a boy. For the first time in my life, I had kissed a boy. Was he angry? Did he hate it? I think I was dying right here, right now. He smiled, he nodded. He put his hands over the wound on my wrist and said, you've got to stop doing that, okay? Did he mean the kiss? Did he hate it? I mean pinching your wrists, hurting yourself. You've got to stop doing that, okay? I nodded and smiled. Promise? Promise. He kissed me properly then, on the mouth. I shivered, but not from the cold. 
So, did the handsome joker make the princess smile? I asked. And then some, yeah. But in this fairy tale, it was the princess that kissed the prince. And he turned into a frog. He started hopping and croaking in a poor imitation of a mutant frog. I burst out laughing and couldn't stop. Yeah, he came back. That's exactly how she laughed. When we did our play for the class then, and we got huge laughs. Not that I actually kissed him in front of everyone else. Well, we went out together for a while, right until the end of school, before he went on to join the army, and I became a psychiatrist, a wife, a mother. We kept up with each other for years and then sort of lost touch. Just the occasional Facebook prompted birthday, New Year greetings. But just the other day, I got a whiff of a familiar fragrance. I followed the scent on the breeze until I reached a spot ablaze with yellow flowers. It was those yellow flowers of August. So yes, this girl's father had been killed. And somebody had told her that it was Muslims that did it. And so she had been fed hate along with her meals. And one day, and I just wanted to share this experience with you, one day in a school in Jaipur, I had told this story and in the Q&A time, which I will give to you as well, one boy stood up and said, um, what you said in the story, all right, we, all, we can, I can agree with that, that all Muslims are not terrorists, but you will have to agree with the fact that almost all terrorists are Muslims. And this is an argument which gets thrown around a lot very carelessly. And he said, what do you have to say about that? And I was lucky that, that an answer came to me. The answer was this. I said, let's look not at terrorism, not at murder. Let's look at a crime like rape. Let's look at a crime like rape. I said, of course, we can all agree that all men and boys are not rapists. Of course not. I said, but you'll have to agree with me that almost all rapists are men. So then using your logic, shall we start treating all boys and men with hatred? Let's not give them jobs, not let, let's not give them admission in school, let's not be friends with them, let, let's not rent out our homes to them, because this is what is happening with Muslims, because of this theory. Then why not apply it down the line? And I looked at this boy, he was 12 years old, and I said, Beta, I don't know you at all, but you're a boy, and so I'll hate you because you're a potential rapist. Would that be all right by you? And he was mad angry at me that in front of his classmates I had said such an awful thing. His hand balled up into a fist and I could see the teacher sort of ready to kind of, you know, get up quickly in case something happened. And I was, I was nose to nose with him. I was like this, you know. And Suddenly, he started to clap. And there was applause in the audience. And this boy said, no one has ever explained it in a way that I really got it today. I got it. Yeah. So don't hate. We are being fed hatred a lot. Don't hate. Don't shut someone's opinion up. 
It's for you to listen. Don't be that extreme right-winger or left-winger, because this is such a political book, so I'm taking you into political, a political arena. So listen, just listen. You don't have to agree. You don't have to become this or that. Think for yourself. Be your own Shah of Blah. You know? Be your own voice. Don't let anyone khatam shud you, ever. Never be a chupwala. Yeah? So that is my takeaway from, from this book. And um, I wanted also to talk about that line which really struck me in this book, in Arun. What's the use of stories? As we saw in the performance right now, what's the use of stories? And especially that, what's the use of a story if it isn't even true? What's the use of it? Anybody? What's the use of a story if it's not even true? Anyone wants to answer that? Yeah. Go ahead. To share a moral, okay. To share a moral, to share a... I mean, look, any good story worth its salt is saying something important. It doesn't have to be a moralizing story, but yeah, it says something important. Yeah. So, another, something else? Why, why is fiction important? Hmm. Yeah. Fourteens, you said. For, okay, fourteen. Yeah, 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 yep. And fourteens, actually, I th I thought that that's what you said because I think that sometimes teenagers feel very alone. You feel as though you're the only one in the world who's experiencing something, um, and through a story, you realize that well, maybe, maybe, there is some but he are else out there who's going through something like this. And because I write for young adults and teenagers, I try, because I know that the teen years are very dark, is, is a, it's a dark time, because you're trying to find where you stand in the world right now. Your parents, your teachers will tell you, you know, stop behaving like a child, you're grown, grown up now. And at the same time, they'll tell you, almost in the same breath sometimes, you're a child, stop acting bigger than your age, right? And you don't, so finding your place, finding commonality with others, uh, that is what, what fiction can do. And I had an interesting experience in Kupwara, North Kashmir, where I had told a story, these were class four children, they were really little. Um, I told a story, they enjoyed the story. They were sort of laughing in the right places, tense in the right places, worried in the right places, relieved when it all worked out. But at the end of it, I noticed that there was some discomfort in the kids. And I asked them, what, what is it? And they, all of them sort of urging one boy to stand up and say, what it was that was making them uncomfortable. And he stood up and said, is the story true? And I said, what do you think? And of course the story wasn't true. It was about, it was about a bear that climbs onto the moon or wants to climb onto the moon to become famous and unique. So obviously it wasn't a true story. But, so I said, what do you think? And they were suspicious. And I said, no, obviously it's not a true story. And they were, instead of saying, oh, okay, it's not a true story, they were like, oh. and their body language went like that. So I said, what, what is it? What, what happened? And again, this boy was urged to stand up and say, if it's not the truth, it's a lie. 
and a lie is a bad thing. It's a crime, it's a, it's a pop. It's against, you know, uh, beliefs, religions, everything. And I say, wait, well, it's not the truth. But it's not a lie, it's a story. These were children, class four little children who didn't know what a story was. They had never been told a story. It's either the truth or a lie. And don't go that way, stick here. So I asked them, any poems, any songs that they knew? They only knew songs in praise of God or in, or in praise of nature, nothing else. So then, I had prepared a whole workshop. It was supposed to be a four day workshop, but I had to just chuck it all aside because I had never had to explain to children what a story is, where do you explain? So anyway, I found a way and we did do it. And they wrote fabulous stories afterwards and went home and talked to their parents about what stories and fiction are and how much they got out of that story. We all do need stories. Okay, I wanted to ask you if you have any questions about the process of writing, what I write, why I write, um, any, anything at all, or about Harun, or about stories, fiction, reality fiction, anything, anything. The floor is open to you right now. Yep. Oh, did I, did a person? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you how I started writing. It wasn't exactly a person. In a way, it was me, which is odd to say that I'm my inspiration, but it's true. So I was in class seven, and so I was about 12 year old, and our teacher had asked us all to talk about um, pet animals we had at home, because she was talking with the chapter we were going to do was the domestication of animals, right? And the settling of nomadic tribes into settled tribes and civilization. So she was asking us about animals and all my friends standing up seemed to have really exotic, wonderful creatures, animals that they had. And all I had was a very old dog who was more like a carpet than a dog. He was an inanimate object. <laughs> lying down, good only for warming your feet on in winter. Even for his susu and potty walks, we used to have to drag him out uh, unwillingly. Um, when I stood up and my turn came and everybody, like you all are looking at me right now, the whole class turned to look at me. And suddenly out of my mouth, instead of old dog, came monkey. So I say, so the teacher says, oh, that's wonderful. Come up and tell us more about your monkey. So I, um, I came up in front and people started shooting questions at me. Um, what is its name? Where did you get it? What kind of monkey? What does it wear? What does it eat? And fat, 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 like butter. I was just reeling the answers out. Um, smooth, smooth, and everyone believed me. And in my head, while I'm doing this, I'm thinking, wow, Paro, you're really good at this. <laughs> and I knew then in class seven that if nothing else, I was terrible academically. I wasn't very good at anything much, but I knew, okay, I could be a writer. So that was what started me off on writing. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say, it's been such an incredible journey because as a writer, you can be anything you want to be. Um, before I forget, by the way, tomorrow afternoon, we have a, a writers, a creative writing workshop, which you can come and join. We're going to have quite an adventure. We're going to have plenty more fish to feed 
plenty new stories coming out and weaving. So if you'd like to join, the timing is from two, from two o'clock at the CF, at uh, CFI, yeah. If you'd like to join, it, you're most welcome to. Yes, you and then you. Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask that, has anyone ever taken offense to your writing, like your stories and all that? Great question, yes. My book, uh, No Guns at My Son's Funeral, uh, has been banned out of some schools, saying it was too difficult for children. But as I said, uh, it was the fastest selling book when kids started buying it. The other one, like Smoke, which I just read from, was a recommended reader in a, um, in a group of schools. And suddenly the WhatsApp army of parents got uh, active, became a mob, and got my book banned. And why was it banned? Because there was a Muslim boy and a Hindu girl who exchanged one brief kiss. And so it was banned. And so this is what I mean. We hate, we, we are teaching divisiveness to our kids, even while we're doing those moral lessons and saying we must love everyone, we're at the same time teaching hate and divisiveness. Yes, there was a question at the back. So I was asking, um, how do you write? Like, do you come up with your characters first and then go along with what you think they'll do? Or do you come up with a general story and then make your characters? Yeah, great question. Um, actually, the process of writing is so elusive that you hope something will come. In any way it will. No guns at my son's funeral. As I said, Kargil, the Kargil conflict had broken out. I was in North Kashmir, right on the India-Pakistan border. Um, and these, at four o'clock the, in the morning, these planes were flying overhead. And then within a few hours, there were injured soldiers and bodies of soldiers being flown back into, I was living in an army cantonment where I was doing part of this world record that, I, that I'm a holder of, I'm a world record holder. So, um, and this title came, No Guns at My Son's Funeral. And I knew that at the end of the book, Aftab would die, the main character. It took me a long while to get there. Mm. While I was writing that book, uh, no guns. I actually become my book. I become the character. I, I'm, in, I'm in their skin. And because it was a very dark and difficult book, I became a very dark and difficult person to live with for my family. I mean, you know, sometimes when I'm very moody and all, and then they ask me, are you writing another book? And I say, yes. They're, they're like, oh, no. Here we go. <laughs> because I... I become the narrative. So I don't write as Paro, I write as the person. And I knew that for the sake of my sanity and the sanity of my family, I wanted to write another book. Uh, and so I started writing Wingless, which is here. Oh, I often write two books at the same time because the dreaded, um, um, Writer's block really frightens me. Uh, so I started writing Wingless, although it was a tough one also, because I wanted to write a book on disability, but I wanted to write a li light and funny book. Uh, and how do you write about dis disability in a funny way without being disrespectful um, and being sensitive? But I was, again, lucky that Wingless did come to me and kind of saved me and my family's sanity. <laughs> yeah, there was a question right at the back, yeah. And then right in front. You're really going to make the mic guy run. <laughs> was there yep. ever a point in time where you wanted to quit as an author? <sighs> yeah. Oh, why? I felt I couldn't write. It was in 1984, October of 1984. Good job. 
Uh, I don't know how many of you know, because it's a long time ago for you. Uh, Indira Gandhi, the Prime Minister of India, was assassinated. And there were very violent um, riots that broke out, anti-Sikh riots, where the Sikh community was being attacked. And after a few days, when things quietened down a little bit, I went to, um, I went to some of the camps and some of the places where the, um, where the rioting had happened. And I saw just such dreadful violence that something inside me died. And I said, I can't write. After this, I can't write. Till then, I had been writing happy stories for happy children. And I said, I can't go back there now. And that kind of thorn in my throat was stuck. I couldn't swallow it. I couldn't breathe. It was, it was physically painful. And it was only a couple of years ago that that thorn finally found a voice in this book, <coughs> Being Gandhi. This is a book not about Gandhi the man, and it's not set during the freedom struggle. It's set in 1984, and it's about the anti-Sikh riots, and it's giving a voice and giving power to young people that when you see something going wrong, act, do something. I think it's a really powerful book. It's a slim little book, but I think it's a really powerful book about how you can dig deep and find your inner Gandhi um, and be a better person. Yeah. Yes, there was a question here. Uh, yeah, do you have a personal favorite book that you've written? That I've written? Yeah. Of your own. You know, I get asked that, and it's such a difficult question to answer because, as I said, I am my books. I've, I give birth to my books. Um, and can a parent say, this is my favorite child, and that one's not? <laughs> yes, yeah, some children, you know, <laughs> some children succeed better. And some children struggle. And some children, really, you have to push. And they're my kids. I can't say, OK, I love some of the books. And sometimes, the other day, I had a, a, a very lovely incident at a school in Delhi where I had written a book. I don't think I brought it. It's called The Other, of how we otherize people, of how we make people how we treat people who are other than ourselves. And um, into that, I, I wrote that book when my mother was on her deathbed. And I was sitting by her side, and I would be writing, because that is my life, it's, it's my breath, it's my air. And I was writing by her bedside, and I wrote about a young girl whose mother dies. And it, the, the, the book is, the title of the story is Grief is a Beast. And um, I was so, uh, I was so moved by that story. And I put it into this collection also because the deadlines had been whizzing past me because of my circumstance. Um, but after the book came out, I wondered whether I should have put that story there. Maybe I shouldn't have. Maybe it was too much for young people. But then I went to this school, and they were studying my book. And I asked them, which one story would you like me to read? And they said, grief is a beast. So I said, um, I don't think I can read it, because I will just cry. It's too raw. And so they said, can we read it for you? And so four of them got up, and they read the story to me. We were all weeping together. Um, I mean, I started crying, and then the ones around me started crying, and everyone was crying. And you know that song, Not a Dry Eye, is eye in the House? <laughs> so that, that's what it was. Uh, and I really thought, you know, never underestimate young people. That was my learning <coughs> from that. 
Yes, there's a question here. There was a question? Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask, is there one book that you would recommend everyone should read at some point in their life? Like any book at all, it doesn't have to be yours. Oh, why can't it be mine? <laughs> it can be anyone. <laughs> Harun and the Sea of Story, honestly. It's just such a fabulous book. Um, there is another one called uh, Angela's Ashes by Frank McCourt. It's a beautiful book. Uh, Boy in Striped Pajamas, I think everyone should read that. Uh, and read it, not the film, but read the book. Uh, don't, don't just go on the book. But really, it's hard to answer that because everyone has such different tastes. As we saw, so many people loved the book, so many people didn't like Harun. Yep, and there is one, two. How are we doing for time? Oh, okay, last two. And if you want to know more, you can come tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Okay, just shout. Uh, so my question was that uh, what are your thoughts on feminism? On feminism. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you for on feminism. Thank you for that. You know, um, I sometimes get very irritated when I'm put onto a panel at a festival or something at a literature festival, women writers, children's writers. They say, why, why can't I just be a writer, you know? Uh, same with my daughter who's a filmmaker. It'll be, she'll be something on, uh, on young, uh, young women filmmakers and young film producers. And she said, no. I mean, I, what both of us were talking about, my daughter and I, was when there is a community which is, has been marginalized, whatever that community, whether it's LGBTQ, whether it's women, whether it's uh, people of color, whether it's tribal people, whatever, when there is a marginalized community, you have to make maybe that safe space for them to have a platform and have that voice. And uh, so, that's, uh, so that is really what I feel about feminism. And I think, I hope that a time will come when we don't need that word anymore because everyone will be equal. And how fantastic would that be? Okay, was there one more question there, or are we? I know that we are. <laughs> yep, okay. One last, no, okay. Great, thank you so much. You know, we were going, I was wanting. <laughs> thank you. I I thought that we would play a game called Twist, Twist or Twister, where we would twist a story around and make it magical. But I'm glad that I did get the time to talk about so many other things. And maybe we can play Twist tomorrow in the, in the creative writing workshop of how you twist the tale uh, around. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed um, sharing my work with you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, Ms. Anand. And I, I think um, it's really special that you read your story to us, which got the book banned. <laughs> you know, because it, that's a prime example of not being silenced. Yeah. Right, that, yeah. that story got that book banned and here we are reading it yeah. today, you yeah. know? Because yeah. it has yeah, yeah. themes that, that are very provocative, right? And might make some people uncomfortable or it, it stirs up certain feelings yeah. in us that are, yeah. you know, not what we're used yeah. to reading, right? And uh, Augustine, I must share with you that the librarian in that school where the book was banned 
um, had really liked the book and felt it was very important that children read it. And so quietly put a couple of copies <laughs> on the shelves and told the kids, read it, and, but read it at, you know, in, in the library. It became the most borrowed book. <laughs> Librarians are revolutionaries. Yeah. Librarians yeah. are revolutionaries. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> if you can, I hope to see you tomorrow at the Creative Writing Workshop at 2 uh, at CFI. Ms. Uh, Paro will be there. We'll be having some more one-on-one -on -one time, doing some different stories. Thanks for coming today. Have a good day. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.